We cannot spend the next four years again studying the same problem all over again. The world is passing us by and our people are suffering today. We need action and we need bold action and we need it now. So let me say clearly, I believe the time has come for members of the Super Committee to embrace the spending cuts and Simpson bowls largely in their entirety, including the, their Social Security reforms. Let me talk for a few seconds about Social Security. When you look at Social Security's underlying numbers, the need for reform is just undeniable, especially when you consider that one of every two children born today is likely to live to more than 100 years old. Think about that. That's great news for the next generation, but to support retirements, we're going to have to adjust. Already, Social Security is the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of the world, with the possible exception of OPEC. And as fewer and fewer workers support more and more retirees, that transfer will get even more burdensome for American workers. In 1950, there were 16 workers for every one retiree, which kept taxes reasonably low for each worker. Today, there are 3.3 workers for every retiree, and in 15 years from now, that number is expected to be only two workers per retiree. That means American will, Americans will be spending more and more of each day working to support other people's retirement instead of supporting their own families. If you do the math, 50-50, 50% for other families, 50% for their own. I'm not sure that the workers 15 years from now are going to be willing to do that. The sooner we address this problem, the more gradual, gradually we can phase in changes. By making modest adjustments to future benefits now, by slowly phasing in a higher retirement age over the next six decades, and by adopting the Bureau of Labor Statistics more accurate measure of the consumer price index known as the chain weighted CPI, which seems to be a point of agreement on the uh, uh, super committee. We can make Social Security solvent for the next 75 years, and we can make sure that young people of tomorrow are not spending far more of the income supporting seniors than the young people of today. Democrats have to accept the fact that there is no ways we can do serious deficit reduction without finding more savings in health care costs as well. For starters, we should adopt tort reform that reduces costs and medical errors, and we should begin moving away from a fee-for-payment system and incentivize spending instead of healthy outcomes. We ought to be paying doctors to keep their patients healthy, not to run every conceivable test whether it is needed or not. You know, we spend $7,500 per year in this country per capita on health care, while Europe spends only $3,300 per capita, and yet they have a greater life expectancy than we do. While the Super Committee is not going to change that in the next two weeks, there is no doubt that serious structural deficit reform requires serious structural health care reform that saves money and saves lives. And without that, we will never get our budget under control. So the public has to get the health care they need and deserve, but they have to get it at an affordable cost. Now, the other side of the aisle. We need Republicans to accept the fact that we have a serious revenue problem, which brings me to the second key principle that I believe can lead us to a pro-growth deficit deal. All income groups have to be part of the solution. It's fair to ask those who earn more to bear more of the burden. That is the whole idea behind a graduated income tax. But all of us should help carry the load. And there is actually a very straightforward and achievable way to do that. Just allow the Bush tax cuts to expire at the end of 2012. Not just for high income workers, as the president has proposed, but for all tax brackets. Along with accepting the cuts in Simpson Bowles, allowing the tax cuts to expire is the other key step that it's time to take. Now, a year ago, I was among those who urged the president to extend the Bush tax cuts for a couple of years, allowing the economy more time to recover. I think it was a prudent thing to do then as a short-term measure. It gave the federal government time to address some of the underlying problems, including our unsustainable deficits. And with the appointment of Simpson Bowles, that looked like a real possibility. Unfortunately, over the past year, 
Simpson Bowles never even made it to the floor of Congress for a debate, much less a vote. And so while nothing has happened in Washington, Europe, we are seeing what happens when deficits are ignored indefinitely. The European experience is a painful reminder that deficits come with economic costs. And by 2013, the huge annual deficits the U.S. will be running are going to be a much bigger drag on economic growth than returning marginal tax rates to their 1990s level. Now, I know opponents of tax increases will yell and scream about taxes and cuts destroying the economy. But the same people said the same thing back in 1993 when President Clinton and Congress adopted those rates as part of a major deficit reduction plan. And I think everyone who reads history will agree. That turned out pretty well. Income taxes in the United States here are lower than they are in most of the, the, developed, uh, in most of the developed countries we compete with. And if we return to the Clinton era rates, they'll still be lower. So there'd be no disincentive for foreign entrepreneurs to come and create businesses and jobs here. Now, interestingly enough, at the state level, it's different. In New York State, we have the opposite situation. Our state income taxes are higher than the states that we compete with, including New Jersey and Connecticut. So raising our state income taxes would create a disincentive for entrepreneurs and businesses to come to New York. And that would make New York State less competitive than we are today. And that's why New York State should avoid a state millionaire's tax. Not only is it the class warfare that divides us when we need uniting, but I think our governor, Governor Cuomo, is exactly right that a millionaire's tax will lead people and businesses to leave New York or grow in other places, and we just cannot afford that. So it's exactly the reverse. The country does not face a competitive disadvantage, even if we raise taxes slightly to, bar, to balance our budget, but some of the states certainly would. Now, I recognize that allowing the Bush tax cuts to expire is not a step that the super committee is likely to take. Uh, but it is a step that the president could take on his own by committing to veto any further extensions. And here is where he should throw politics aside and lead, not follow the conventional wisdom. If Congress knew for certain that the Bush tax cuts would expire next year, in the months ahead, it would increase the likelihood of a bipartisan plan to reform the tax code in a way that would simplify it, increase revenue, and increase economic activity. For Republicans to, coming to, to come to terms with the need for more revenues also means identifying tax breaks and loopholes, and they've said that, as well as subsidies that don't make economic sense. It's encouraging the Republicans. Uh, uh, it's it encouraging that Republicans are taking steps about closing some corporate tax loopholes, but they shouldn't stop there. Farm subsidies that drive consumer costs should be dramatically cut back, if not totally eliminated. The same grows for many of the tax rates and subsidies we give to the energy industry. And since fair is fair, tax loopholes in the financial industry that are outdated should be closed too, such as taxing carried interest at ordinary income rates. And I say this even though many of the people who would be affected are my constituents, so I assume I will get some phone calls later this afternoon. Taking the steps I've outlined this morning, particularly adopting the cuts in Simpson Bowles and allowing the Bush tax cuts to expire, would allow us to achieve a goal that, incredibly, is not even being discussed in Washington right now. And that is balancing the budget in 10 years. The spending cuts in Simpson Bowles plus Clinton era tax rates, uh, plus closing some tax loopholes and ending wasteful subsidies would save about $8 trillion a year and effectively bring our budget into balance by 2021. If the world's richest country can't balance its books over the course of a decade, something is terribly wrong. It's not just not that difficult to do if you have courage and we shouldn't accept the usual excuses. People can say that this Congress and president will never do it. Well, it is up to us to hold them accountable, not just for clearing the lowest of hurdles, but for adopting a mature, serious, long-term, clear agreement that will set our country on a path of fiscal responsibility towards a return to economic prosperity. Now, the ideas I've put forward today aren't intended to be a cure-all. In addition to getting our fiscal house in order and giving businesses the confidence they need to start up the jobs machine, 
We need to take, undertake major reforms in many areas. We need a less costly, more effective health care system, as I mentioned. We need lower and flatter corporate taxes, because when you have the world's second highest corporate tax rate, you drive away investment. And most urgently, we need an immigration system that stops depriving us of the entrepreneurs, scientists, engineers, and laborers that we need to grow our economy. It's terrible economics. I call this one national suicide, and it's one of the other examples of how Washington is preventing our economy from adding jobs. These next two weeks will tell us a lot about whether Washington is capable of moving our country forward. I'm an optimist, so I'm hopeful that members of the Super Committee will recognize that this moment isn't about what the party leadership will say or how a party faction will vote or what impact it will have on the next election. It's about our future, and it's about having the courage to do right by our children. America's greatest moments come when Washington has risen above politics as usual and worked together to solve the toughest problems, not as party loyalists, loyalists but as loyal Americans. And that's the sense of common purpose we see from coast to coast, in blue states, red states, and purple states. It's the can-do spirit that has always defined our country. And it's the understanding that, in the end, the future of the greatest country in the world rests in our own hands. Let's not screw it up. Thank you.